Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Epic booth. And my name is Daryl Albert. I'm a technical marketer for Epic. And today we're going to be talking about design visualization using Unreal Engine 4.23, which is in beta currently. So we're going to be going through this relatively quickly. We have about 20 minutes to talk about a few concepts. And what they're going to be is Datasmith, rendering look development, virtual camera input, as well as the collaboration template. So Datasmith is our way of getting CAD data and data from DCC apps into Unreal. And it's really amazing. It does lots of really cool things. It handles solids model packages really nicely. Gives you the ability to tessellate that geometry. It works brilliantly with packages like 3ds Max, Cinema 4D, and Blender. One other thing that's really great about Datasmith is it preserves all your scene hierarchy and your file system structure. It brings in the metadata, and it makes sure that all your pivots and local offsets are set correctly. So it's a really exceptionally good tool at getting that high quality data and a very high visual fidelity into Unreal. The next thing that we want to talk about is look development. And we're going to be touching on PBR materials ever so slightly and how they work inside of Unreal. The new HDR backdrop, which is new in 4.23 hybrid ray tracing and how we're approaching ray tracing inside of the Unreal Engine to maintain the performance that we need but still achieve extremely high visual fidelity. And we'll finish off by quickly talking about the post-processing effects and how we can use those to really take your images to the next level. So the virtual camera is something that we're going to be playing around with. It's going to be running on an iPad, so we're going to be plugging that in, and it's going to be used to drive a very physically accurate camera model inside of the Unreal Engine. We're going to also talk about templates and the template workflow. So these are workflows that we've decided to develop. It basically gives you starting off points, a little bit of logic, a little bit, a bit of game code that allows you to take your design data into Unreal and quickly work with it and do some very high level things in a collaborative way with the, the, the template tool. So we'll be checking that out. So that's basically what we have to talk about in the next 18 minutes now. One thing worth mentioning is we do have tech talks happening outside of the booth. It's also on the sign um, directly behind you guys. So make sure you check those out. They're really pretty awesome. And with that said, we're going to jump into the Unreal Engine and start playing around with this design data. So what we have here is an asset that's come in. And this is uh, obviously some CAD data. It's pretty high quality data. Um, all the geometry inside of here is actually modeled. So all the rivets, all the cut lines, all the seams, everything on this is actually True, uh, truly modeled, physically accurate geometry. This is about three and a half million polygons that we brought into Unreal Engine. And this is sort of one of the default lighting starting templates. So it's just a you know, procedurally generated sky with a ground plane. So what we want to do is we want to get this into an environment that's a little bit more visually compelling, slightly richer in its quality. So to do that, we're going to be using the new HDRI backdrop. So if we go over to the light section on the left-hand side, I can simply drag and drop this HDRI backdrop backdrop into my scene. And with that done, what we're going to do is we're going to just set its orientation properly by hitting the reset button. You can see as soon as we drop that into our scene, how much better the helicopter is looking. It's reacting to that lighting because it's a high dynamic range probe, and it's reflecting across the surfaces in a very realistic way because we have RTX enabled. So this is using ray tracing. In this scene, when we're ray tracing, for every pixel, we make a choice about whether or not we want to use a ray trace ray or the default rasterized renderer. We're doing this so that you can balance visual fidelity versus performance on a per pixel basis. So there's thresholds that get exceeded, and that's when rays get decided to be thrown or not thrown. And it really gives the artist a lot of control on, again, fine tuning that performance for the visual fidelity that they want. Now in this scene, I'm ray tracing reflections, I'm ray tracing reflections on translucency, I'm ray tracing ambient occlusion, and I am also ray tracing um, the shadows. And by ray tracing all of those different passes, it really does allow this to look much better than it would have in the traditional kind of raster rendering workflow. So let's go ahead and turn off a few of those effects just so you can see the difference. Like on the ray trace reflections on the translucency, I'm just going to use a, a simple control variable to turn that to a zero state. And you can see that's what the glass would have looked like without ray tracing. And it, it still does a pretty decent job. It has some nice faked reflections and things like that. But as soon as we turn on the ray tracing effects for that glass, you're going to see that the reflections, especially across the top of the helicopter there, where you get the, the reflection of that, that kind of boom or that arm kind of coming up, and, and you really get a good sense of, of what that looks like. Another thing that's interesting about this is the shadows. So if you look at the shadows right now, um, we've, got, we've got the HDR lighting model in there, and I've also got a directional light that's going to be kind of 
pump, pumping on the sun a little bit hotter, sort of like a key light that I've put a traditional light, a traditional unknown directional light in there. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go and start to adjust the light angle, the amount of spread that those rays are going to spread out to simulate a more overcast day. And what that's going to do is it's going to soften those shadows. And it's a very, very subtle effect, but it goes a long way into adding that realism that you need. So if we go back into this light, and you can see I have its light color temperature set to like 5800. And we take this source angle and we overdrive it to something like 5. As soon as I do that, you can see that you know, these shadows kind of, and I'll overdrive the intensity just so you can see the, in, the shadows a little bit better. As I adjust this light angle, you can see the shadows softening up on the shadows that are far. So these objects are basically, you know, those top rotors and things like that. But notice how crisp and tight the shadows stay where the landing gear starts as I adjust that light angle. And that transition and layering of soft shadows on top of, uh, you know, kind of hard crisp shadows based on object distance really is the benefit of ray trace shadows inside of Unreal Engine. So another thing that's kind of interesting about this is the ability to turn on and off reflections based on and, and make these decisions based on post-processing volumes. So inside of Unreal, we can set things globally, or we can set things inside of a defined region or a post-process volume. And they're really super, super powerful. So what we'll do is we'll just drag one of those into our scene to, uh, to start checking that out. So I'll just come over here and I'll just search for post to grab that guy out. We'll drop that into our scene. And what we're going to do is we're going to first set this to be infinite. So the, the idea is sometimes you might want to have a post-process volume in a specific area. You walk into a room, you want that room to behave differently than it does when you walk outside of the room. That's the power and the benefit of post-process volumes being able to define. In this example, it's just a global environment, so we set it to infinite. And what I want to do is I want to turn off the effect of the reflection ray. So if we kind of look underneath the helicopter here, you can see that we've got this really nice reflection happening. And notice what happens when we jump back to more of a legacy reflection model, a screen space reflection model. So we'll just jump into uh, reflections, we'll turn this switch on, and we'll jump back to screen space. And you can see the difference between those really very clearly here, how that, that reflection model starts to behave in a more realistic manner. An easier way to overdrive this is actually just to view straight reflections. So this is with ray trace reflections. Everything's reflecting you know, realistically, right? If we kind of zoom out here, you can see how realistic that is. And if we go back to the legacy way of doing it with screen space reflections, that's faked reflections. And that's really what the power of the RTX card brings to the table, is the ability to do this while still maintaining 70, 80 frames per second for this given asset, which is it's pretty spectacular. So the next thing we want to do is get back to our lit mode. And I'm going to go ahead and let's get that light looking a little bit better. I'm not liking it with the shadows being quite that soft. Let's go ahead and just turn that guy down to a value of Three looks a little bit better, and we'll get that source angle back down to something like one. So we talked about the HDR backdrop and that lighting model. One thing that's worth mentioning is if you want to change the look of this scene or the feel of this scene, all you have to do is drag and drop another light probe onto that HDR map. So this is really easily done. I'll just drag out something like this guy, and we'll throw it on there. And you can see how everything basically updates and reacts correctly or properly. The final thing that I want to do is I want to change the way my bloom or my highlights are working. As I move around here, you can see that we're getting a little bit of glow kind of popping over and up in this region. And as I move across the surface here, you can see that specular highlight kind of moving across the surface. These are all done with PBR materials. The PBR materials are kind of reverse engineered from the host application that you're coming from. So if you're using Revit, it uses the Autodesk material. It has very specific sets of names and sliders that uses a, a glossiness model. So when you bring data in from something like Revit, it's going to basically take that shader model and present the same exact attributes to you inside of Unreal. So it allows you to work in a way that feels very familiar or comfortable to the application that you're using. So that's worth mentioning. So the final thing that we want to do is on that post-process volume, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go to the Bloom section. So in the post-press volume, we can adjust film, tone mapping. Um, it works with open color I.O. You can do all kinds of color grading. You can also adjust how lens flares and blooms and glows are going to work. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually go in here to the Bloom section. And we're going to change the Bloom model from the standard model over to this one. And you can see as soon as I do that, we get this really realistic little, little starburst happening. And you know, like these nice pops, you're going to see a pop kind of come off the tail as I move around there. All that little subtle detail is just you know, really, really cool. And if we zoom in here on this paint, you can see that I've got you know, a little bit of orange peel sort of 
right here you can see on the areas that are really close. I don't know if you can see it on that monitor, but you, you might be able to. There's orange peel. There's all these little subtle noise and scratch effects. That's all built into the standard PBR workflow that's derived from the roughness maps and a normal map to kind of get that super, super beautiful look to it. So let's go ahead and hit play on this guy. And when we do that, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be jumping into a mode that was set up using the collaboration template. So this ships with Unreal. And what it does is it gives you some code logic that builds this little user interface for you that allows you to run around your object. And this, this, when we hit play, we're entered into the runtime. This is basically the executable or the gamified version of these assets. So as you start to fly around this helicopter here, when I'm in this game mode, I can start to do some pretty interesting things. If I hold down my space bar and we kind of fly forward here, let's just kind of move forward here and jump over to the walk mode. So let's just escape out of that guy and get ourselves repositioned over here. We'll We'll jump back in here, and we'll jump into the walk mode. So when I'm in the walk mode, you know, I, I kind of hit the ground. I'm going to fly around on that guy. And it gives you the ability to jump in and out of VR. So this is something that we changed recently inside of Unreal Studio was the re-engineering of this template, giving you the ability at any time to basically turn on and turn off VR. It works with multiple users, and it's, it's super, super powerful. So the next thing that we're going to look at, and this is, this is the area that's, uh, that's really pretty cool. We're going to try to plug in this, uh, this iPad and see if we can get the virtual camera working. So this is the highest risk portion of the demo. Let's hope that it works, and we'll check it out. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch over our game mode from the collaboration template into the virtual camera game mode. So this comes with Unreal. It's, it can work with um, the virtual camera can work with AR Kit. It can work with Live Link, which is sort of an open protocol for establishing connections between different types of input devices. And it can also work with Vive and Vive Pucks. So in this example, we're going to be using AR Kit to drive it from this iOS device, this iPad Pro. So the next thing that we want to do is just go into our project settings and just switch a few things over on inside of here. So let's just go to our maps and modes. We're going to switch this from collaboration template over to virtual camera. And we're going to make sure that we're set to game instance down here, which we already were. So with that done, I'm going to also turn on always display mobile input touch devices. So with those few switches on, we've now reconfigured this project to use completely different game code or game logic when we hit play, right? Instead of being using that multi-user collaboration template, we're now going to be using a virtual camera input device. So how do we go ahead and do that? Well, we basically go ahead and let's plug in. And it might take a second for this. So we're plugging in. Um, we're using a USB-C to Ethernet connector on the iPad mainly because there's so much Wi-Fi noise in here. So if you're in your, your environment and you don't have a lot of competing signals like you have on a trade show floor, Wi-Fi is going to work really, really solidly. But in this example, we've just, we weren't getting a good clean signal. So what we decided to do was basically just use the iPad to do it. So you can see it's going to go ahead and it's going to connect. And in a few seconds here, it's, gonna, it's basically going to handshake and sync up, hopefully. Oh, there we go. It took, took a second there to establish itself. So there's our helicopter. and. On this iPad, I've got lots of controls. Um, I've got the ability to you know, kind of move my camera around, track my camera around. You can see the MTA in the upper right-hand corner. That's specifying how we're going to be handling doing our, our depth of field, right? So if, I, if I'm in, uh, on M mode, I can basically touch an object. It's going to take the point that I touched, show me a really quick clipping plane on where that focal point's going to be, and then go ahead and generate that. Or we can just go into an auto mode. The T would be for a tracking mode. So I'm going to put my auto tracking point to the kind of center of my camera here. And now if we go ahead and start to fly around this helicopter, let's kind of just move over here and do something kind of like this. You know, you get these really, really beautiful depth of field effects. All that glow, all that bloom sort of happening on top of that guy. You can obviously go in here and change your, your camera lens. Um, let's go down to something like a 40. You can, you can kind of pan up. So all the control that you want inside of this camera is, is right here at your fingertips. And the thing that's kind of cool about this is, you know, obviously, as we kind of move around this guy, you can see the depth of field kind of grabbing to the focal point there. Maybe I'll grab a point there. And as I shoot down the tail here, you'll see that it kind of pulls focus as I, as I move down that tail, you know, kind of pop in there. Let's go ahead and maybe even give it a lower f-stop just to get a little more depth of field in there. So you can see you know, we're really overdriving that depth of field combined with that little lens flare there, that little, that little glow effect happening. This is, this is amazing, right? We're running at 70 frames a second here with 3.5 million polygon CAD data asset that we just brought right in. And it just looks, it looks super, super cool. 
I, I could do this all day long. So the other thing that's kind of interesting about this is we can set up waypoints. So I can basically say, you know, I want to record that. So if we click on this. We've now just recorded a simple waypoint. So here's a whole list of different waypoints that have actually been, you know, kind of sampled around. Oh, that one put me somewhere weird. Let's bring that back up and get back to this one. Oh, yeah, now we're on a tail one. So you can record waypoints. You can also do, re oh, I like this one. Look, look at the depth of field on that. So we'll just kind of pop this and then put that into focus. Super, super cool. So if you look at the options for the camera, the other thing that's kind of nice about this is there's different controls for how this camera stabilization is going to work. You can also lock out different axes. So if you want to kill the Dutch that's doing all the rotation, you can. Obviously, it's set up with a kind of traditional film back with a gate in front of it, so you can define and match the sources that you want to use exactly as you would expect. And the final thing that you can do with it that's really pretty cool is you can record takes. So I'm just going to go down here and hit the record button. So we're going to get a little countdown happening, three, two, one. And I'm just going to kind of move across the, uh, the shot here. So that's all good. We can hit stop on this guy. So now that, we've, now that we've done that recording, we can basically kill this guy. And we'll exit out and see what we get. So we'll process those frames. Hopefully it doesn't die on us. It looks like it made it perfect. So we're going to go back into the Unreal Editor now. And now that we're inside of here, we're, we're kind of back in our, in our content creation mode. We're going to go back to the, uh, the root folder of our project, which is right up here. And you'll see that we now have a cinematics folder. In that cinematics folder, we have the takes. So uh, this is to the 31st. So this is going to be our nonlinear editor. So this allows you to animate cameras as well as actually any attributes, any, any characters, things like that, lights inside of Unreal. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and just kind of expand this out a little bit. We'll go and we'll activate this clip to make that now be the primary source that's driving that viewport. And we'll start to kind of scrub through this. So that's, that's the take that we just did. So that is basically it. That's Unreal Studio 4.23. We saw some pretty cool stuff today. We talked about PBR workflows, how the ray tracer works, and those choices that we're making at a per pixel level for the hybrid ray tracing, post-processing volumes to go ahead and get that really nice, cool glow effect inside of there. We talked about the collaboration template for a few minutes. That, again, allows you to have multiple people log into the same session and work with it. And we finished off with the virtual camera and how that's driving a physically accurate camera model inside of Unreal. And we can obviously take recorded takes and use our camera sequencer tool to output this. It's worth mentioning also that if you wanted to get this, this video out, that clip, at any time you can render that out to, an, to, a, to a render passes. We can export out EXRs, AVO, OVAs. And there's lots and lots of functionality and freedom for using this in kind of a traditional post workflow also. So keep that in mind when you're checking out Unreal Studio. And it's free, which is also pretty awesome. Again, everybody, thank you for your time. And make sure you check out these classes here. We'll just pull this slide up one more time. These are going on today, and they're, they're super, super fun. Thanks for your time, everybody. Cheers.